Hi, this is ESPN's Dave Lamont, and you're listening to the Sports Objective Podcast, the unofficial podcast of the Pirates. Welcome into the Sports Objective. We appreciate everyone tuning in whenever and however you're watching and or listening. You know, you know whether it's um, on Facebook, YouTube, or pretty much anywhere you can listen to podcasts, you can listen to us. And uh, just over 24 hours away from the start of the Greenville Regional, or Super Regional, I should say. And right now, to take a look at that matchup between East Carolina and the University of Texas, very excited to be joined by the play-by-play voice of the Texas Longhorns, Craig Way. Craig, we appreciate your time this morning. Bob, great to be on with you. I appreciate you having me. No doubt. Uh, you know, so much excitement building for this matchup between the Pirates and the Longhorns that will get underway on Friday at noon on ESPN2. And uh, so just, if you would, you know, just talk about um, your venture to Greenville. I'm obviously coming out of that Austin Regional And uh, we'll, here in a moment, dive deeper into the season that the Longhorns had under head coach David Pierce. But, um, you know, Air Force, it came down between the uh, Falcons and the Longhorns there in Austin. Well, I'll tell you, Bubba, the Air Force Academy, uh, and Texas knew this uh, in advance, uh, was probably as the the most difficult number four seed for anybody to have to deal with. The Longhorns knew this about Air Force because the Falcons came in for a double midweek back in April and Air Force beat Texas in the first game, 14 to two. And in the second game, the Longhorns had like an eight, one lead and it was 10, six in the eighth that Air Force caught them. And it took a walk off two run homer in the bottom of the ninth for the Longhorns just to split the series. They knew what Air Force was all about. They knew that the Falcons had a uh, legitimate first-round draft choice pitcher in Paul Skeens, who was uh, hitting upper 90s with his fastball and an outstanding slider and all of those things. And uh, the Mountain West Conference Player of the Year, the first baseman, Sam Kulasingham, who hit over 400 this year. So they knew it was a quality opponent. And even though they handled uh, Air Force in the Friday game in the regional opener, they kind of had a feeling maybe they hadn't seen the last of them. And they had an Air Force went about its business. They beat a good Dallas Baptist team that had a top 10 RPI in the elimination game on Saturday. Came back against Louisiana Tech, a team that played Texas very tough on Saturday night in the winner's bracket. And uh, the Longhorns pulled away in the late innings. Uh, and La Tech, of course, with the Conference USA uh, regular season champion. And uh, they just kind of outslugged them because they could swing the bat and got it to the Sunday night game. And and then the Longhorns uh, hit on all cylinders, both offensively and and in their pitching and defense. So uh, they knew they were going to get a a quality opponent in the Air Force Academy. It was a very impressive showing uh, in in front of the Longhorn fans. They uh, were chanting USA, USA to the guys uh, when it was over and gave uh, the the Falcons a standing ovation. There, There was very much an appreciation for what that program is and what Mike Kozlowski as the head coach has done. So uh, in winning the regional, the Longhorns knew they would get tested. And even though uh, a couple of those final scores may not uh, necessarily illustrate that, uh, they knew they were in a fight throughout the course of the weekend. Now, Craig, I know off the air, we were talking about the adversity that each of these ball clubs has overcome. And you have East Carolina who um, at the midway point of the season was 24 and 18 you know, learning how to, you know, play without Carson Wisenhunt in the rotation. You know, he was going to be the Friday night guy, um, considered by some to be the top left-handed arm in the country and a probable first-round draft pick. You had that uh, dropped on you right before the start of the season. And uh, quite frankly, um, the Pirates didn't know how to handle success early in the season. You'd see the glimpses of uh, what this team could be, and then they turn around and kind of lay an egg, but uh, they figured it out there midway through. Uh, Coach Godwin changed the the way uh, this team is led, going to a more player-led style, and uh, that happened right there at the start of the conference season. 
And then you have the University of Texas, who was also preseason top 10, and not only top 10, but number one by a lot of um, polls, I think D1 baseball included. And then they also sustain significant injuries to their roster. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the team uh, that is that is playing in the Super Regional now is is a bit different than the team that was the preseason number one. It was the number one team in the country for the first couple of weeks. The team that began the season was much more like the traditional Texas Longhorn teams built on pitching and defense. Now, sure, they had offensive weapons returning from last year's team that went to Omaha, but it, 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 traditionally and historically, Longhorn baseball teams have been built on pitching and defense, and they had three uh, legitimate outstanding starting pitchers. Pete Hansen, their uh, you know, redshirt uh, junior left-hand, sophomore left-hander, uh, the Friday night guy. Tristan Stevens, a fifth-year senior who won 13 ball games last year, was the Saturday starter. And Tanner Witt was a sophomore that had mixed between uh, closing and starting for Texas in his freshman campaign and perhaps the most talented of the three with his fastball in the upper 90s and a wipeout slider and a great changeup. And he looked the part in the, his first two starts, including uh, the shutting out Alabama. He had done a great job, but uh, felt tightness coming out of that game uh, a couple of days afterwards. They didn't think it was anything big deal, but they held off on not having him throw on the side. They later did an examination that week and determined that he had damaged the ulnar collateral ligament. So we've all been down that road understanding what Tommy John surgery is all about. It was going to take him out of the rotation. rotation. So then it brought about a scramble also because the guy who had been pretty much tabbed, uh, their, their closer, Aaron Nixon, <laughs> had had uh, a little bit of arm tightness. And then he, when he came back, just was not quite the same and really struggled out of the pen. So it brought about a changing of roles. Tristan Stevens, uh, the fifth-year senior and the Saturday starter who had been so effective last year had ran into some midseason issues, but then they had a real need for the bullpen. So he has transitioned into the pen, uh, and it would be difficult just to label him as a closer because he's done a little bit of everything. Uh, for example, in the Saturday night regional game against Louisiana Tech, he came on in the sixth inning and, and gave the Longhorns three and two-thirds innings. So – uh, he's transitioned into that role, and they moved a young sophomore left-hander named Lucas Gordon into the rotation. Uh, and uh, he, his first start was against UCLA in uh, the uh, Shriners Hospital Classic there at Minute Maid Park in Houston, run by the Houston Astros, and uh, had a little bit of a rough go. It was okay, uh, but I think took the loss against UCLA. And since then, He's been lights out. He's he's really it, well, it's been a gradual ascent for him, and he's gotten better and better. So he's been able to fill that role to number two spot. The number three starter, uh, that's still you know kind of uh, a, a pieced together situation. That's how it was for the final game of the regional the other night. That's how it was in the Big Twelve Conference tournament. The Longhorns wound up playing uh, a total of five games in the Big Twelve tournament, where they kind of had to. Uh, bullpen it together on a couple of starts. They reached the Big 12 Tournament Championship game and then just ran out of pitching against an outstanding Oklahoma team that's one of the hottest teams in the country right now as they get ready for their Super Regional in Blacksburg at, at Virginia Tech. So uh, it's been an ongoing developmental process for this Longhorn baseball team, especially from the pitching perspective. Now, very quickly, before we shift over and talk about this unbelievable lineup that uh, David Pierce has, um, you know, led by the Hispanic Titanic, uh, Ivan Melendez, um, if you would, you know, tell us a little bit more about that top arm. Pete Hansen, uh, East Carolina announced yesterday uh, when Cliff Godwin had his media availability that not surprisingly that left-hander C.J. Mayhew would be getting the ball on Friday. So if you would tell us about Hansen and um, what makes him so successful, because I believe he's 11 and one now. Yeah, and and he will not. Uh, you know, wow anybody with an electric fastball. He'll touch low 90s, uh, 91, 92, occasionally 93, but he's a he's really a 90 to 92 guy in terms of the fastball. Uh, he's got two pitches that are really, really good. He's got, uh, he well, really three because he has a breaking ball, the harder slider and then a slower breaking ball. Uh, and uh, it's the, both of those are very effective and he can throw them in and then he can throw up chain. He can throw a change up to a left-handed hitter with anybody in the country. And he can, he's got a change up that can be really, really special. So I think that it, those are the things that make Pete's weapons good. And then the other part about him, Bubba is, 
he's from California and he's got that California cool about him. Gordon's the same way. Uh, both of those are California kids and they're just, they're just as laid back and easy going uh, as, as guys that in terms of their makeup. Now they're competitors, they're bulldogs on the mound, but the, they're, they're largely unflappable. They, they are able to pitch against really good lineups in good environments, including this environment of, of having to go into the jungle and, and pitch. They're both looking forward to the opportunity. Yeah, we'll certainly talk more about the jungle here in just a moment because um, I know that's something that David Pierce was asked about by the local media there uh, in Austin on uh, Wednesday. But you know, it, now uh, shifting over and talk about this lineup, it's obviously led by the Hispanic Titanic, Ivan Melendez, hitting 404, 30 bombs, 92 runs batted in. And uh, he's one of three finalists for the Golden Spikes Award for the top player in college baseball. He is he's something special and, and really and truly far more learned minds and historians of Longhorn baseball are the ones that I've asked about Ivan and, and you know, how uh, what they think of him. And, and there's no better source on this than Keith Moreland, who played third base at Texas was an All-American, hit 410 is his last year on the 1975 National Championship team. Keith played 12 years in the major leagues, most of those with the Chicago Cubs, and uh, is a broadcaster now on the Longhorn Network telecast and also works with us on a lot of our road uh, broadcast um, on the radio side. And Keith says that Ivan Melendez is the best right-handed hitter in Texas Longhorn history. Now, that's pretty high praise considering the guy who said it is largely considered by a lot of people to be the best right-handed hitter in Longhorn baseball history. Uh, but but Ivan has uh, what Keith and what others have described as just that, that real professional approach to the plate. He separates balls from strikes very well, and he does have that power as a, setting the University of Texas single season home run record with 30 uh, this year. And uh, just to, and, uh, another guy who is uh, a quiet leader, um, and his teammates gave him that nickname, the Hispanic Titanic. And that started last year in Omaha when he hit that home run through the rain uh, in that Friday night uh, crazy game uh, that lasted until after midnight against Mississippi State to force the final uh, w- uh, winner take all elimination game that Mississippi State won 4 uh, 3, so, or 2 1 the second game. So, anyway, they had two great games with Mississippi State, and, uh, and Ivan played very, very well. And at times, he's just been in such a zone that it's been extremely difficult to get him out. Now, part of that, uh, there's a really good hitter behind him in Murphy Staley, who uh, is a fifth-year senior, another California kid. Uh, Murph uh, was a guy who was hitting at the for a lot of the season well over 400. In fact, he was leading the nation in batting average for over a month. He at one point batting 475. Now he's he's uh, tailed off about 100 points since then, but he's still. Uh, swings a good bat. Uh, they've also been able to use uh, a six-year senior in Austin Todd is a unique story uh, in front of Ivan from time to time. And Austin uh, is a guy who came in when David Pierce came in. His, Austin's first game was David Pierce's first game, the season opener in 2017 against Rice. Uh, we did some research on this. Austin Todd is the only player in NCAA history. Now you think about this in the college baseball level. He's the only player in NCAA history to start six consecutive opening days. And, and it just, it, it, you'd say, well, how's that? Happen? Because, you know, most college baseball kids aren't staying more than three years anyway, but the pandemic changed everything as we know. And, and also injuries to Austin. He separated a shoulder diving back to the bag. Uh, that happened in uh, 2021 and missed uh, the vast majority of that season, came back this year as a six-year senior. Same type thing, was diving back to the bag uh, and back to the bag and, and inj- re-injured the shoulder and was out five weeks after that. That also was a part that hurt the Longhorn lineup uh, and when, when Texas had a little bit of a dip during the season, were struggling. And Eric Kennedy, their left fielder, who uh, was outstanding hitter and great speed on the bases, also injured a hamstring against Oklahoma midway through the season, struggled, re-injured it against Air Force in the double midweek, so he's missed significant time. It's allowed for a young man named Dylan Campbell to emerge a little bit and and uh, start in the outfield, but they've, they've kind of had to plug in, Coach Pierce has had to plug in some pieces there to make it work, and all of those weapons 
and, and a couple others have helped make Ivan Melendez uh, the, the National Player of the Year candidate that he is. And I think he's already won the Collegiate Baseball National Player of the Year. Uh, you mentioned him being the Golden Spikes uh, Award finalist. He'll be a Dick Hauser Award finalist. I'll be surprised if he doesn't win at least one of those two as well. I'll tell you what, you look up and down this lineup, uh, just – you know, crazy the the numbers that this this offense has put up. 317 as far as the team batting average, 118 home runs, uh, 151 doubles, slugging 556, and uh, you have three guys um, in addition to the Hispanic Titanic Ivan Melendez. You have also uh, you know, Murphy Staley and then Skyler Messenger um, that are hitting 370 or above with 10 plus home runs. Uh, Staley with 17 and then uh, in excess of 54 RBIs. It's uh, just unreal. Well, and, and I'll tell you this too, Bubba. It's like I said, historically, Texas teams have been built on pitching and defense. Uh, this particular one has had the offense and they play in a very uh, pitcher and defensive friendly ballpark. The UFC Dish Falk Field is, is pretty spacious. And, uh, you know, it's usually about it, it takes until well into May, if not close to June, for that southerly breeze to kick out on hot nights and then all of a sudden make it more of a factor. Most of the time you're getting a northerly breeze blowing in and the ballpark plays much bigger than that. But these guys have been really, really good. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Skyler Messenger and I didn't want to leave him out. He's also a unique story. Skyler uh, is from Niwak, Colorado. And of course, uh, it, you know, uh, there's wasn't a lot of collegiate baseball opportunities in the state of Colorado. And Skyler signed with the University of Kansas, played four seasons, including the pandemically shortened one in 2020. And the Longhorns had to deal with Skyler Messenger every year. And he was always uh, batting about 300, somewhere between 330 and 350 for some Kansas programs that had really struggled. Well, Skyler earned his degree, had a year left because of the pandemic. The, the one thing that was missing from Skyler Messenger's resume was to play in an NCAA tournament because the Kansas program has, has had its struggles. And, uh, and so as a grad transfer, he transferred to Texas and had and got off to a really slow start. It took him a while to adjust. And then he got on a hot streak and was batting around 350 most of the season to 360. Uh, we get to the NCAA regional. It's his first ever regional game. We're thinking, okay, how's Skyler going to do in his first ever regional game? He went four for five and then tore up the regional rest of the weekend, was named the most outstanding player of the region. So we were like, well, I guess NCAA tournament play is to this young man's liking uh, because he's he's done well. So he's another unique story about this ball club. You know, you talk about the um, the pitching and the defense of the Texas Longhorns, and you look at both of these clubs, they have both been – you know, very good in terms of the pitching. Um, and then defensively, they've been elite. Um, the Longhorns are 987 in terms of their fielding percentage. I know East Carolina's right around 983, 984, which was top five nationally. So that means Texas, I, I didn't confirm this, but they got to be first or second. They've, they've been very, very good defensively all year long. When you see the middle infield, of this, of this team and really the infield overall. I, Ivan Melendez answered a lot of questions. He was drafted later last year, but, but wasn't drafted very high because he was a DH and folks, a lot of major league scouts said, well, he doesn't look like he has a position to play. Now I've heard that argument about guys before. I remember doing games when Texas played Baylor and Baylor had a player that they said, well, this guy doesn't really have a position. He can just hit the ball. That's Max Muncy, who plays for the Dodgers. And uh, I saw him drop a couple of balls into the Brazos River when Texas played in Waco against Baylor. And I thought, they'll figure out a position for him. And Max certainly has done that. Well, in the case of Ivan Melendez, he took over at first base. And uh, when he took over at first base, he seemed a natural for it. So he's played very well. But the middle of the infield is going to impress you. Uh, uh, Trey Faltini, the shortstop, and the second baseman, Mitchell Daly, and Murphy Staley also plays second base. And they, again, this goes to that rotation because the injury uh, that they've had, uh, Tara Kennedy, and they'll platoon Dylan Campbell in. That's why I think you'll see Campbell in the lineup with C.J. Mayhew with the, with the lefty going uh, for the Pirates. I think you'll see Campbell in the lineup. But if it goes back and into the bullpen to right-hander, Kennedy will probably go back in the lineup. Staley can play all of the infield positions and plays the corner outfield positions. He's that versatile. And so he played second base in the first two games of the regional and then in the outfield. So I think uh, 
you know, you can see him. But but Mitchell Daly, when he's out there, is an excellent defensive second baseman, not quite the hitter that Staley is, and they want Staley's bat in the lineup. But that middle infield combination of Faltini and Daly has been solid all year long. Skyler Messenger has been a rock uh, over at third, and and Ivan Melendez as well. Kennedy, outstanding defensive outfielder, uh, and and Doug Hodo is another one of those guys who can get to just about any fly ball. So there's they, they have a lot of good defensive weapons, and that's why that fielding percentage is where it is. Really appreciate your time this morning, Craig. Uh, one final thing for you as we're wrapping this up, because I know you have – a few different interviews that you're doing, uh, talking about tomorrow's Super Regional. And uh, you know, as you take a look at it, David Pierce, who spent 15 and 16 as the head coach at Tulane, uh, Cliff Godwin's first two seasons back here at his alma mater. And then uh, Coach Pierce had been a longtime staffer for Wayne Graham there at Rice from 2003 to 2011. And he'd also been on the staff at the University of Houston uh, when the Pirates and uh, and then Cougars were, you know, in the uh, old Conference USA days uh, back in 2002. But uh, he's very familiar with the jungle and the atmosphere at Clark LeClaire Stadium and uh, the passion of the East Carolina fans. So if you would, I know um, there's a comment by David Pierce on Wednesday um, when he was speaking with CBS Austin sports anchor Jeff Barker. Uh, and we're actually going to talk to Jeff later on the night. But um Tell us what you know about the East Carolina atmosphere through Coach Pierce or otherwise. Sure. And and I've known quite a bit about the ECU atmosphere. I'm a native North Carolinian. I grew up in Greensboro. And um, Oh, wow. And, did, did not realize yeah, that. Yeah. So I, I'm well acquainted. Actually, I have a brother who lives in New Bern and I uh, – and I, uh, my freshman fall semester in college, I went to UNC Wilmington. I go back on vacation every summer and 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 uh, rent a beach house down in Brunswick County, either at Sunset or Ocean Isle. So I'm all about this state. And uh, my dad uh, was from North Carolina, and I've got friends and family uh, still uh, back here in the area. So I've known about ECU and and what the program has been about for some time. And what uh, Coach Pierce said, and it was in a general media session, uh, was as much with admiration and respect as, as, uh, as uh, bluntly stating how difficult a place the jungle can be. And he, he said that I'm used to it. Uh, I've, I've been there. I know what it's like. They're, they're fans. He said, I had, we had, to, we had uh, issues with uh, the security with the bullpen and we had, you know, fans have thrown some beer on the players and stuff like that. He said, our, our players know, Hey, this is a tough place to go. And he said, they, they call it the jungle and they, and they said, and they, and, you know, and, and they live up to it, you know, that sort of thing. So he meant it as much uh, complimentary as well as this is a tough place to go. He said it to, to make sure his players understood that you're not walking into a place that doesn't care about baseball. Uh, that it means a great deal. And what coach Godwin, who is a friend of his has, has done with the program has been nothing short of outstanding. So it was meant as much out of uh, respect and, and as a compliment as anything else, as any other way it might have been interpreted, understanding that this is not going to be an easy place for the Longhorns to come and play. Have you happened to hear where all 600 tickets gobbled up very quickly? Very, very quickly. And uh, and then, it, you know, it's amazing. Uh, like I said, Bob, I'm from the state of North Carolina. It's amazing. Relatives and friends I haven't heard from and. 20, 30 years all of a sudden contacted me on Facebook and said, hey, I'd love to come see the Super. Can you hook me up with a couple of tickets? I'm like, unfortunately, uh, that one's out of my department. I said, uh, between the NCAA and the university handling their tickets just to make sure they barely have enough for uh, uh, families of the players. I said, I'm, I'm out in the cold on this one. Sorry, can't help you on that. Yeah, it certainly can be a rowdy atmosphere, but at the same time, I think a lot of, uh, you know, including – to lane fans uh, i saw a picture last week when um the guy uh, jared Plummer, that runs the ecu jungle account on twitter he was interacting with some opposing fans just saying hey yes it's going to be a hostile atmosphere but at the same time we're friendly you know come see us we'll you know we'll uh, give you something to drink and eat and that kind of thing so i think a lot of times you know you know how it can only take uh, one or two individuals to uh, to give somewhere a bad rap. And I know Coach Pierce uh, meant that in a complimentary way, like you were saying, but uh, that's something that I think on the whole that Texas fans will be very pleased with their, their experience this weekend. But again, appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, if somebody happens to not be able to attend the game and not able to watch, uh, you know, tell them how they can listen to your call. 
Well, I appreciate that. And, and uh, yeah, we obviously on the Texas Longhorn Radio Network, we uh, folks can listen online for free at texassports.com. Uh, it's also on the Texas Longhorns app. Uh, obviously, our flagship stations in in Austin, the Horn, uh, 104.9 FM and AM 1260. So it's all a part of that. And uh, we, we're, we're looking forward to it. It'll be an awful lot of fun. All right, fans, that is Texas play-by-play voice Craig Way as East Carolina will be playing in its third consecutive Super Regional, the fourth in the last six years and seventh all time, And uh, but is the first on campus at Clark LeClaire Stadium. Um, but tremendous atmosphere ahead, so much excitement. Um, but remember, be sure to uh, follow us on social media at the Sports OBJ on Twitter and TikTok. On Instagram, you can find us at the Sports Objective. Like and follow us on Facebook. And, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. But, again, for Craig Way, the play-by-play voice of the Texas Longhorns, I'm Bubba Rosenbaum. You've been watching and listening to the Sports Objective. Have a great weekend, everybody, and take care. My heart is purple and gold. I'm a pirate down of my soul. And I don't